let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. I am a convert of almost a year from Mormonism. I'll talk to you a little later about Mormonism, but Dr. Bergsma has suggested that I first tell you something of my story. I grew up in a, what we might call a lukewarm or vaguely Mormon household. My father was not a member until very late in life, and my mother was, at best, you could call her semi-active in the Mormon church. And that would be a very generous estimation. She uh, went very rarely, but she sent the kids. As a teenager, I went largely to play sports and because they sponsored the scout troop. I was not active in the Mormon church in college until the last year or year and a half. And that was basically for social group reasons. I went to, uh, when I went to Harvard, I went to the local Mormon church because culture, social reasons, and those kinds of reasons. Mormonism makes two claims, and I'll just mention one here and then I'll explain it later. Mormonism believes, Mormonism is if you took one, if you took the reformers view of the Catholic Church, if you took Luther's view when he calls it the whore of Babylon, when he talks about the Babylonian captivity of the church, there are similar passages, in some cases even more vituperative, from Calvin. Am I not right? I, I, I studied Calvin in, as, a, as a theological student. My copy of the Institutes is heavily marked up. But if you take that view of the history of the church and make it orders of magnitude greater, you get Mormonism. Mormonism believed that there was such a great apostasy, breakdown, from the somewhere in the early church to 1820, that the church needed a restoration, not simply a reform. It needed a restoration. So there had to be an enormous breakdown in the early church. Enormous. My first year at Harvard, in the fall of 1970, that story broke down. The Theological students, no matter what you're focusing on, had to take courses in a range of things. And I, that first semester, decided to take the history course I had to take on the early church, which I knew nothing about. They didn't really offer that at the University of Utah, where I double majored in history and philosophy. And of course, my own tradition never talked about that. So I took a, church, a course on the early history of Christianity. And I started reading the patristics. And guess what? That story unraveled. 
I realized that the story I had grown up with was bogus. It was wrong. There was a development of doctrine, not a breakdown of doctrine. Look, I'm not even in the same uh, galaxy as blessed John Henry Newman. But my story unraveled the same way his story, uh, his Calvinism unraveled. Studying the early church, you find there's a development of doctrine, not a breakdown. And started to un it really started to unravel. The other thing that happened that first year, and now I know why, though I had been accepted at other schools straight for the doctoral degree, fully funded, why? When I walked onto the Harvard campus in March of 1970, I knew that was where I was meant to be. Even though I had to pay for the master's program myself and there was no assurance I would be kept on for the PhD, I might have to apply elsewhere. I would have to apply elsewhere, but I knew that where I, was where I was meant to be because I had to take the course and I took patristics. And my oldest and closest friend, I roomed with that first year, and we've become, we've been friends forever. He was a Catholic from Notre Dame. And he took me to the vigil mass that April. I had never seen anything so majestic. I was deeply affected by that. We stayed up till probably four o'clock in the morning talking about it and me asking questions and he just patiently answering me. So the intellectual part of the unraveling came. The spiritual journey took longer. at least two or three times in the years since 1970 until 2010 when I made the definite commitment to convert. Two times for certain I knew that God was calling me and I turned away. Friends say, how could you? Catholics say, why didn't you? <laughs> My closest friend, a great patristic scholar at the University of St. Thomas in uh, the Twin Cities, he was teaching at the time at University of Santa Clara. I had a conference in the Bay Area. Uh, it was only a day, day and a half drive, so I took the kids and my late wife, God bless her soul, uh, went down because she has a brother who died uh, in November, uh, who has a great big house in the Bay Area, and we stayed there and we stayed there a week and had fun times. And I went down to Mike, my patristics friend at Santa Clara, took the days touring his campus and we talked and talked and talked and he just looked me in the eyes at the end of the day and said, Richard, you should be a Catholic. Something inside of me at that time said, you're right. Psalm 93 explains my story. Sure, there was culture and inertia and, you know, but 
Psalm 93 is the, it, it explains a lot of it. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Mine was hard for too long. Sure, my wife, for the last uh, probably 15 years of her life, was up and down with her health, mostly down, took a lot of energy, because you got a son and a daughter who have turned out really well. But I remember one time, another translation of that is, uh, do not turn away. Uh, if today you hear his voice, do not turn away. I, uh, the turning was literal. I had a grant from the Templeton Foundation to develop a course and bring in speakers on science and religion at Utah State University. One of the speakers I brought in was a Catholic theologian from Georgetown. And I put up a lunch for the Newman Center students. Uh, actually, I, the priest before that priest I had been good friends with, uh, Father Frank Volmecki, because he was a PhD from Notre Dame in medieval philosophy and had studied under a, a friend of mine, who's been a friend for decades, the late Ralph McInerney, and God rest his soul too. Uh, but Father Clarence was at the lunch, and afterwards, it was a wonderful spring day, probably early April, and we stood outside. It was nice, it was warm, it was spring, and we talked for maybe 15 or 20 minutes out in this little uh, kind of patio area by the student center where we'd had the lunch. And I asked him, Father, you probably you need to get back to your office, because at that time they didn't have the big new church that we have now. It was, the Newman Center was the whole ch Catholic church for our, our, for our Cache Valley, and uh, it was a block away. And I said, Father, you must need to get back there. And he said, no, I have a pretty free afternoon. I felt strongly that I should go with him back to his office where I could talk about the faith that I wanted to have and didn't have and unburden my soul. I did not. I literally, he went this way back to his office, a block, block and a half away, and I went this way back to mine. If today you hear his voice, do not turn away. There are a lot of people out there your age who are wandering. I encourage you. Help them find their way. Two decisive moments in the actual decision to convert. In February of 2010, I uh, got a flyer for an international conference on Dietrich von Hildebrand in Rome on his, focusing really on his book, The Nature of Love, translated brilliantly by your esteemed professor, Dr. Crosby. And I felt, I have travel money. Not a lot of universities still do, but I have travel money. And if my travel budget would pay for part of my trip to Rome, I should take the advantage and see Rome. I persuaded friends to come with me.
And that was the beginning of the real end and the renewal. I'll just read you the first two paragraphs of the piece from First Things because I think it, it expresses it in a way that just saying it can't do. Early in the evening of May 28, 2010, I am attending Mass in the majestic Basilica de Santa Polinaire next to the Pontific University della Santa Croce in Rome. From Utah, I have come as a scholar to deliver a paper at an international conference on the work of the great Catholic philosopher Dietrich von Hildebrandt. I have come as a tourist, and I have come as a tourist, to see the Eternal City for the first time. Mass is being celebrated in the Basilica for those attending the conference. I am not Catholic. In fact, I was raised a Mormon, though I have had serious doubts about the Latter-day Saint faith for decades. Yet my journey of the heart, which ultimately ended in the Catholic Church, came long after I had intellectually departed, so I cannot receive Holy Communion. But when Archbishop Raymond Burke place, places his hand on my head in a blessing, the extraordinary presence of Jesus Christ moves my soul to tears. I now know in my head and in my heart that I have come to Rome as a pilgrim. I have finally heard his voice, and I will not turn away. That fall, there was, uh, fall 2010, there was a conference being given in Park City. It was called Immaculate Mary Divine Mercy Pro-Life Conference. I unfortunately cannot remember the pro-life woman who spoke though I've been a total pro-lifer for my whole adult, since I was in college. And my mentor at Harvard, though he's not Catholic, his moral teaching could easily be Catholic. He was on the, as a tenured faculty member at Harvard, you don't earn any brownie points being on the board of Americans United for life for 25 years. He took time out of revising his magnum opus, which is like Aristotle starts the moral life in the family, not as a loner, but as a member of a family. That's where the moral life starts. Uh, he took time out of revising that for a definitive second edition to write two books calling Dr. Kevorkian a murderer, which is right but you don't have any brownie points at an Ivy League school for, for doing that. But they had a, this conference in Park City, and I could go just for the admission fee because my sister has, a, has our old family house with a nice two bedrooms downstairs, and I could stay there 40 minutes from the Park City, so I went. But on the Saturday afternoon, the speakers were Father Wade Menenzies. Some of you may see him on EWTN. And Deacon Alex Jones, who was a black charismatic preacher especially hearing Deacon Jones, I knew what I had to do. I knew it as clearly as I'm talking to you today. That night, my brother, he has a, 
He owns a number of small houses on a side street in Salt Lake that's kind of dead end. It's kind of like a quarter of a block or, or a third of a block, maybe a half a block. So they closed off the street, got permission, and had an Oktoberfest party. It was warm, it was wonderful. He had a big uh, tap with Schwartz beer, that German beer. Unfortunately, my uh, di diabetes and alcohol don't mix, but I did have some. <laughs> I'll confess that. But I pulled him aside. He's now a rabbi. So that shows you how our family, we neither one of us went on missions and that sort of thing. He's now a rabbi. And I pulled him aside and said, Robert, we got to talk. And then I told him. He said, Rick, you haven't believed in Catholicism, you haven't believed in Mormonism in 30 years. Or 35 years since you were a graduate student at Harvard. I knew you were going to become Catholic 35 years ago. And a lot of my friends say, yeah, you sound, I have a student, or former student. She graduated from Utah State in philosophy. She was my student assistant. She taught for a few years at the Catholic High School in Salt Lake Judge Memorial. Then she went on and got a graduate training, a master's at St. Meinrad's School of Theology. Now she teaches high school uh, in the shadow of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And when she found out I had converted, she was overjoyed. And she said, and she read my thing on why I'm Catholic and asked if I, she could use it with her students because she says a lot of her high school students have grown up with this idea that all the really smart people are atheists, even though they're going to Catholic high school, and they're trying to wrestle with that question. And she said, I want to show them the story of a Mormon-raised, Harvard-trained philosopher and theologian who found his way to the Catholic Church. I said, sure. But she told me that when she was my graduate, well, not graduate, my assistant, she said, you sounded awfully Catholic. I'm the last to know. But then I went through the journey. And I was baptized last Easter. And it was majestic, glorious. Something you can't put into words. But though he was transferred after he gave me the right of acceptance and I had become an official catechumen, he was transferred that July to another parish in the diocese. The priest who first got me formally involved and gave me the right of acceptance to have me become a catechumen was the same priest that about 10 years earlier I had turned away from. People ask me, how would your late wife have thought about this? I think she would have been, I think she is now overjoyed. She wrote a master's thesis on a French Catholic African poet who was the first president of Senegal who was deeply Catholic and her thesis was on the religious part of his poetry, Leopold Sedor Sangar. But more important is this. 
when her aunt and uncle didn't have any children. It was her mother's sister. They didn't have any children. They had grown up in a Mormon environment. Her, my wife's grandfather was a United States Senator from Utah for 18 years. But her aunt and uncle didn't have any children. They were in the foreign service. But that was simply the cover. He was actually CIA. He was head of the CIA in Paris in the 50s. And because they didn't have any children, they would take nieces and nephews to stay with them for a couple of, for a time when they were living abroad. She uh, was there in the mid 50s for two years, became absolutely fluent in French so that great French thinkers couldn't tell that she wasn't French. I can tell you a story about that, but that's not relevant to this. But they put her in the exclusive French Catholic girls' school. This was when they had girls' schools and boys' schools. This is when there was no messing around in school. These were pre-Vatican II nuns. <laughs> Maybe... John remembers that environment. She could stay as late as she wanted to study at the school because they had a really exclusive apartment in the best section in Paris. But she could stay as late as she wanted because an embassy car and driver would pick her up and take her home. And he would open the door for her and all these things. Second year she was there, they took the girls of that class down on a spring break tour of Rome. I have some old black and white photographs of Vatican in 1956. So. But they took the girls down and they got, because I guess of who would they are, because this is the place that in the 1950s this was the head of NATO and all the generals put their girls there. All the international businessmen put their kid, kid, girls in this school. The French elite put their girls in this school. They got an audience with Pope Pius XII. And they lined up, single file, and he gave them each a rosary that he had blessed. Now, most... Mormon girls in that environment would have taken that back and thrown it away. Her aunt and uncle, who weren't active in the Mormon church, didn't ask her to do that. I don't know, in the Calvinist church, would the girls have thrown that away because it's a, possibly a demonic symbol, you know? Yeah. She didn't throw it away. She kept it. She cherished it. And now I have it to say the rosary every night. I, I think she's extremely happy. Now, you can ask me any other questions you want about my journey in the question period. You can ask me any questions you want about Mormonism in the question period. But let me tell you something briefly about Mormonism. There are two fundamental kinds of beliefs that make up Mormonism. The Catholic Church does not make a statement about who's a Christian and who's not. Just like the Catholic Church doesn't decide who's going to heaven and who isn't. My students ask me, does the Catholic Church uh, believe that anybody who isn't a, a baptized Catholic is going to hell? Some students even ask me about limbo. 
which was one of those gossip things that was never actually a doctor, just gossip. But I say the Catholic Church doesn't decide who goes where in the afterlife. Who makes that call? Who makes that, who makes that, you've made the decision, but who makes the final placement? God! <laughs> Nobody else! But the two, but the Catholic Church does decide in conversion who has a valid Christian baptism and who doesn't. I have a colleague at the university, teaches economics. He's strong in the parish. He converted the same time I did, but with a different process, though he went through the kind of adult study classes with uh, he and his wife just had a baby and, and baptized it at the end of December. Beautiful. She teaches economics too. She's a devout Catholic. He was raised a Southern Baptist. That means his baptism was a valid Christian baptism because it was a Trinitarian baptism. Mine in the Mormon church, which came almost a year after you're supposed to be baptized, give you a little tidbit about my family. Uh, was not a Christian baptism because it wasn't Trinitarian. Because the Mormons don't believe in the Trinity. The two things that I want to, I can use this one and I'll leave that up for anybody who wants to still write it. Two, two sets of beliefs that make up Mormonism. One is they widen the gap to an existential gap between Jesus and the patristic church to 1820 when Joseph Smith had his first vision. That's what the claim is, first vision. That they widened this and they're never very clear when the church went off the rails. But it's usually thought to be pretty early. Uh, well, I'll just, I won't do that. But it's an existential gap. where Luther and Calvin thought that Augustine was the greatest previous Christian thinker. I mean, Calvin's Institutes, the number one source other than scriptures that he cites is Augustine. The Mormons would never do that. It's earlier than that. They're not clear. Neither is Luther, neither is Calvin exactly when. But they widened this. There's an existential gap. This for Mormons is called the idea of the apostasy. They widen that gap to where it's not even recognizable. The, it needs to be restored, not renewed or reformed. You don't need a kind of reform that, that St. Saint, Saint Francis was called to give more concern for the poor when Christ appeared to him on the, over the altar in the little church at Assisi. You don't need a new language to renew timeless truths, kind of like Vatican II proclaimed. Vatican II didn't make a break in the church. It made a kind of new language to express timeless truths. Or Paul VI made the absolutely right call in Humanae Vitae. But then, Blessed John Paul II gave a much richer, deeper argument, renewed the argument in a much more positive way than had ever been done. Didn't change the fundamental principle, just renewed the 
the argument for it. This is the Mormon idea, you need a restoration. But if there's no existential gap, then you've really got a problem. So they put an existential gap where there isn't one. And then they put no gap where there is. God, persons, no gap Joseph Smith, in the last year of his life, last few months of his life, gave two talks, called sermons, if you will. And one of them is let's see if I've got the exact. One of them has become, it isn't in Mormon canonical scripture, but it's as near as you can get, and it expresses the Mormon truth, a truth about Mormonism. Not that it's a true teaching, it's just truth about Mormonism. Joseph Smith said, quote, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man. God started out on a world like this one and then became God. Huh? You mean he didn't create everything creatable? No. He's an organizer. He's a manager. He's not a creator. He is an office, like captain, and not a nature. There could be millions, millions, millions of human beings who have become God through a developmental process. There's no existential gap. So there's no need for an incarnation in the way traditional Christianity or Christianity holds. Since you don't need an incarnation, you don't need a trinity. Mormonism is not a monotheism, even a Trinitarian monotheism such as we proudly proclaim. It is a polytheism. That's what it is. And when I ask students, and last semester I taught philosophy of religion. I teach it every other year. I have a strong colleague in the parish and in my department. 40% of our five philosophers at Utah State University are really strong Catholics, and both of us are converts. <laughs> he and his wife tried to make Anglicanism work. It didn't. Maybe the Anglicanism of C.S. Lewis's day would have been okay, but Anglicanism is not the C.S. Lewis Anglicanism. <laughs> I wonder, you know, Tolkien, who was a devout Catholic, always tried to get his colleague C.S. Lewis to convert to Roman Catholicism. I wonder if now, the way Anglicanism has gone, he might have succeeded. You know, Lewis would have said, this is wrong. <laughs> well, it is. So is Mormonism. <laughs> but uh, Mormons... The Mormon view of creation, if you will, reminds me of a, a, a funny story. The scientist comes to God and says, God, we've got it all figured out. We know how to make life. And God says, hmm, that's interesting. Show me how. And the scientist says, well, you take some dirt. And God says, wait a minute. 
Get your own dirt. <laughs> but, but last semester in philosophy of religion, uh, I was talking to students, and they wanted to talk. So a lot of them are Mormons. And, and this one girl expressed a view that was widespread among the Mormons. She said, yeah, I'm a polytheist, but I want to be a monotheist. I want all the advantages of monotheism. I want to believe that God, I want to believe in the God of Boethius. Well, I'm sorry, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You've either got to have the God of Boethius or this polytheism that you want to be attached to. A couple of years ago, when I was just becoming a Catholic, it was just starting in RCIA, uh, the, uh, I was teaching philosophy of religion, and then every other year my colleague takes it, and then I get to do a senior seminar that I've been doing uh, called Philosophical Theology. In the fall of 2010, I decided we'd read one masterpiece. So I had 10 students, and we studied Augustine's De Trinitate, which is Christianity and Neoplatonism on every page. It really is. So I, they had to learn Neoplatonism like, like a graduate student would because that's what Aquinas, Augustine uses. But a couple of years ago, after a discussion like this, I asked them, why do you worship the captain and not the top general? Because there's only one top general of all the military. And I was explaining this. And after class, this young woman engaged me in a longer conversation. I said, well, here's the, here's the problem with that. Why not worship the top and not the, you know, you're, you're worshiping the angels and not God. And I explained it and explained it. And she, she said, well, if that's the price, then I, and this is an exact quote, then I don't believe in a top God. What? You don't believe in a top God? She didn't. And that was Mormonism. It's an office and not a nature. There's no gap here. So there's no need for a trinity, no need for an incarnation, no need for most of what historic Christianity teaches. Now, the Mormons say historic Christianity was so corrupted that we need something additional to the Bible. We need the Book of Mormon, which Joseph Smith supposedly got from an angel and tells a story about uh, people in the ancient New World who fled from Jerusalem about 600 and came to this continent somewhere in Central, Central or S South America and set up a civilization. Well, the Mormons keep revising where that was and how that happened. Because there seems to, there's no evidence to support it. And in fact, the genetic evidence but the origins of people in the New World absolutely contradict that story. And I have a friend who teaches at Roanoke College who's having a discussion, and they know each other really well with a, with a Mormon person I know, a scholar at BYU, a scholar, he's a popularizer at BYU, and the students asked him, this was last fall, during the Romney campaign, the students asked him, what about the evidence? And he said, doesn't matter. It's a matter of faith. Well, there are certain things that are matters of faith. But then there are certain things where the evidence contradicts it. You have evidence anyway. And you disagree with it. Or you say, doesn't matter. It's a matter of faith. So... 
if there's no, there's no gap here and there's a gap there, that's just backwards. And the uh, Mormons have what they call the Joseph Smith inspired version of the Bible. That is where Joseph Smith took the King James Bible and made additions or detractions or deletions from it. And they have that now. It's the official Mormon Bible and those things are in the footnotes. But they're important. for a whole lot of reasons, but I'll give you one. Yesterday, I did the tape, the program over in Zanesville. And they have people, I think it's, it's broadcast on radio and then it's going to be broadcast on TV, Journey Home. And they got some emails coming in and Marcus read them. One of them is, one of them was to me was, how do we, it wasn't really confront, but how do we deal with Mormon missionaries when they come to our door? What can we say to them that might be helpful to them? And so I said, well, there are two things you can challenge them about. One is the commission, or the, the yeah, commission to Peter in Matthew. You are Peter. And upon you, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So ask them, did Jesus get that right or wrong? If he got that right, then you should be Catholic. If he got that wrong, you shouldn't want to have anything to do with any organization he founded. Should you? You should either be Catholic or shouldn't be any organization he founded. And then I said the second one is just point out to them in your Bible, the King James Bible, which is of course a bad edition. It's, bad is too strong a word. It's an imperfect edition of the Bible. Uh, particularly for the, well it doesn't have the interesting thing is that Luther thought that Augustine and the patristic church was right, mostly. But then he didn't use the Old Testament that they used, the Septuagint. Huh? He thought they were great. And then the church went off the rails somewhere in the Middle Ages. But he didn't use the Bible they use. He didn't include the Septuagint, the, the uh, material that we have in, the, in our Bible, in his Bible, which became the basis for the Old Testament in the King James Bible. He, the New Testament in the King James Bible came from Erasmus's 1516 first printing of the Greek New Testament. Now, Erasmus was a wonderful scholar. He did a, magif a magnificent uh, service to getting the New Testament out. But he used manuscripts that were eight or nine hundred years later than the earliest manuscripts we now have, but they weren't available in Erasmus's time. Also, he did a really interesting uh, translating job or editing the text, John. He had the Greek text. And he had various copies of the Greek text. And there was a gap in here. So he said, I have the Vulgate. If the Latin says this, then the Greek must have said this. And he put it back in the gap he had. Didn't think that, that was the way you were supposed to do things. But... They have this Joseph Smith inspired version in footnotes, but don't, it's not inspired. Well, it may be actually inspired by forces of darkness. But 
here is what the, here, it, the first thing I would ask a Mormon is about the commission to Peter. But I'd do this one too. I'd say, let's go to the Bible. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it talks about the real presence in the Eucharist. Jesus never says that it's only symbolic. The Patristic Church never said it was only symbolic. It wasn't for a thousand years in the mid 1100s, that would be, you know, a thousand plus years, that anybody thought it might be symbolic. And it wasn't anything that a church was built around until Zwingli. Even Luther believed in the real presence. But go through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Then John 6, which is one of the greatest passages in all of Scripture. Jesus explicitly teaches the real presence. And then John records that many of his followers thought that was too hard, and they left. And then he turns to the apostles and says, I suppose you're going to leave too. And Peter, in one of the great lines of all scripture, says, where would we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. I didn't realize that until the last couple of years. But where would we go, Lord? And then you have the uh, 1 Corinthians, where Paul teaches the real presence. Ask your Mormon friends, ask Mormons you come to know, Ask the Mormon missionaries if they approach you. Just say, here is what is in the Bible. Five separate places. Matthew, Mark, and Luke at the Last Supper. John 6 and Paul. Now, does your church teach the real presence? No, they don't. It's all symbolic. Oh, well, that's a problem. Actually, what they have is Joseph Smith's inspired version. He says, no, it didn't really mean the, the real presence. It meant symbolic. No, it didn't. The earliest manuscripts we have, the patristic writers, for a thousand years, nobody disputed the real presence. And it's five places in the Bible. There's no place where it can plausibly be translated anything other than the real presence. So that's what I would ask your Mormon friends. They don't believe in the Trinity. They're polytheists. They, and they're also Pelagians. They believe that works are essential to salvation, that you earn your way into heaven. Now, they will say, we also believe in God's grace. But they believe that what you do is, is the way you earn your way into heaven. Uh, there's no question about that. I've been teaching this semester for religious studies, first time ever on our campus, a course called Introduction to Christianity. And the way we've done that, most of those courses I see around the country are historical. Mine's not historical. We have a historian, wonderful fellow, who teaches history of Christianity. My course is not that. We did first some of the Bible, 
We did the Gospels of Matthew and John. We did Isaiah 53 and Daniel 7. We did uh, Romans, James, and 1 John. But also, uh, when we did the Christian appropriation of the Old Testament, we read a selection from Gregory of Nyssa, Life of Moses. But then we did the Creed. And the students, many of whom are Mormon, were, their eyes, they were getting, what? I never heard that Christians believe that, that the other Christians believe that. It was news to them, the creed. And then we've been going through se uh, section by section of the creed. We read a little bit of Augustine on the Trinity. We read Calvin on the Trinity. We've read uh, God is creator. We read Basel. Hexameron just means lecture or sermon one. And, uh, and then uh, uh, last week, first part of last week, we spent a day on St. Clement's letter to the Corinthians. And it's black letter in there. Works come after faith, not before. True works come after grace, not before. They aren't a way you earn grace. And, you know, but Mormons are polytheists, Pelagians. They don't believe in an existential gap here. They believe you earn your way into heaven. Uh, they're not Trinitarians because they don't believe there's one divine nature. But they do believe the church needed to be restored. But if you talk to Mormons, first things to talk to them about if, if you want to talk about faith is the commission to Peter and the real presence. Just say, look, here it is. It's in the Bible. You believe the Bible, right? It's in the Bible. Five places. And yet, you're saying these, all these five places got it wrong? And you're saying Jesus got it wrong when he claimed that the church that he founded would never be overthrown? Just raise the questions. But for me, as a kind of philosophical theologian, I know I'm going a little longer, so just three or four minutes, just two minutes. For me, as a philosophical theologian, the biggest personal hang up with Mormonism, is it has no tradition of faith and reason. Neither do evangelical Protestants for a lot of periods. The Calvinists do, but a lot of Baptist evangelicals don't have a tradition of faith and reason. Mormonism has no tradition of melding faith and reason. as a friend of mine is quoted. I more than once in Mormon Sunday school classes, I asked difficult questions and was basically told to shut up. Politely, but I was. And I'll just read this one. A longtime family friend in Logan, who also returned to the Catholic Church after years as a Mormon, has witnessed the changes in Sherlock. Quote, philosophers dig, dig, dig for clarity and truth. And now Richard's been set free from a cap on questions to pursue a truth that transcends our best inquiries. What I see is a sense of joy in him that is wonderful. Remember what Frank Sheed says in his wonderful little book, Theology for Beginners. 
A mystery is not something we can know nothing about. It's something we can't know everything about. And the Catholic Church revels in the melding of faith and reason, in using reason to explore the deepest questions of human existence. And in the years, in, in the time since it's become public that I've converting and have converted to Roman Catholicism, I've had probably 20 students come to me with existential questions. They grew up Mormon, they don't believe it anymore. They're trying to see if that there's another way. Because Mormons are told it's either us or the devil. And I'm showing them that there is another way and they can come and talk to me about it. In fact, I had a young woman come and see me just a week and a half ago, a week ago. She grew up as a Mormon and now she's been, I don't know what it is, set apart, whatever, something as a, as a Wiccan princess or Wiccan leader. She's realizing that's not right. She gave up Mormonism as a teenager, and now she's having all sorts of existential questions just from, she took my philosophy of religion class, and it was eye-opening to her. And uh, I only hope I can be helpful to her. And I hope that I have been helpful to you. With that, I will take questions. Yes, and then him. Um, you had said that, that they don't believe that God is creator, so how would Mormons suggest that the beginning of, of the universe came about if the God who created our world was just a man who then became God? Uh, they don't have a good answer for that. I have had the most distinguished Mormon astrophysicist of his generation, who was professor at University of Indiana for years. He was provost of the University of Indiana. I've heard him. I have him in a paper saying this, but then I've heard him live say this. Since the Big Bang is true, the Big Bang started without matter. Big Bang is true. God is physical. Therefore, God has to come in after the creation of the universe. How can your life have meaning in a universe that has none because only intelligent agents can give things meaning? And if God didn't create the universe, if it just happened, then you're back with Stephen Hawking. <laughs> At least he knows the science. Okay, that's, yeah, now I had a hand over here, and then I'll come over here. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Well, do you want the day of my baptism? Is that what you chose to be converted? Well, I converted in the heart. Well, intellectually, I converted at, you know, when I started reading the Patristics, uh, fall of 1970. Then the main thing was I had it the April 20, uh, the May 28th in Rome when I had that experience with Cardinal Burke. And I actually got to sit at Cardinal Burke's table for lunch last fall at the Fellowship of Catholic Scholars in Washington. Um, my good friend, president of it, uh, Father Joseph Katursky, is a philosopher at Fordham. Uh, he, he knew it, and Burke was a featured speaker there, and he said, why don't you come and sit at our table for lunch? Uh, and then a marriage. Mormonism is a classic cult. And I don't say that as some sort of demeaning word. Uh, sociologists and anthropologists of religion have a definition of what constitutes a cult. It has an authoritative leader. It has secret rituals. Uh, it has an in-group and an out-group. Uh, lots of definitions. I can console myself in some way, not entirely, with the fact that a, a man as smart as Augustine was a member of the Manichees for 10 years. And talk about a cult. But Manichaeism 
is Mormonism. Because Mormons believe that God is a physical being. It's just a different kind of matter than you and me. Manichaeism. They believe that there's an eternal battle between good and evil. That Satan is in a way co-equal with God. That's what Manichaeans believe. Mormons believe that, Satan, that evil is eternal. Satan is always there. It's Mormonism 101. But they have a temple. And in the temple is where faithful Mormons are supposed to get married. And the temple rituals are, they call them sacred, but they are secretive. Non-Mormons cannot attend the temple, so they cannot see their children get married in the temple unless they have a temple recommend, which is a process of questions that you get asked by your local leader. And that's Mormonism. S secret uh, marriage ceremonies. Mormonism gave up plural marriage a century ago. Uh, early part of the 20th century. They gave that up. But they didn't give it up in theory. That is, they still believe that they will be married to whoever they're married to now, forever, if they remain faithful Mormons. So that if you get married to him in a Mormon temple and remain faithful Mormons, you, couple, will be eternal together. And if you get married and your wife dies, you can get remarried in a Mormon temple to another woman. They do believe there will be plural marriage. They haven't given this up in the heavens. Although I thought Jesus said there wouldn't be marriage in heaven. I thought that was pretty definite in scripture. Okay, who else had a, yes, you had a question. Okay, so you had said that there's, since they don't believe in the Trinity, they don't, they don't have a need for an incarnation. No. So they don't have a need for a savior in that sense because that is why Jesus was like in Well, they will say that Jesus came to take our punishments. They, they, they do say that. That's what they do believe. But Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, particularly Jesus and God, are separate persons, separate physical beings. God right now is a physical being. And, there's a, and they are separate physical beings. So there's not an actual one divine nature because there can be millions of gods. Well, he's, yeah, he's fully man, but, yeah, but, 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 but there's no divine nature. Oh, there's no divine nature, period. In no, Jesus. no, there's not one divine nature. So then how could he, because, then how could, essentially because of the fall, because of sin, like, I'm just trying to like, get inside a Mormon's head here, um, <laughs> like there is, No, they believe that the, they believe that the fall was fortunate because it got us out into a world where we could grow and develop, be like God. But doesn't Catholic theology from the Patristic say that we grow, we, we continue to like grow in heaven in a sense? Well, in a way, but not, way. not the, it's not the same. All right, other hands, let's see. I got one here, one here, and one here. We'll just keep going as long as you want. Um, well, you, you, know, you say that the history, they're not really definite on when they break off the, the early patristic church. So how would they respond to someone like St. Ignatius of Antioch or St. John the Mother, like these really early fathers that are very Catholic? Uh, they don't. They ignore that. <laughs> the, the earliest, you see, Mormons believe that works play a role in whether you get to heaven or not. Your works. And uh, there's a book that every Mormon has, and I keep my copy for reference purposes. It's called Mormon Doctrine by an esteemed Mormon leader who was an apostle. It's called Mormon Doctrine. 
And in there, when he has this section on good works, he quotes the Anglican 39 articles, which on this point are perfectly orthodox. And he says, see how bad other churches are? Because they talk about grace and salvation and they have nothing about good works. Well, they're right, but, but some, the earlier than both of the authors you mentioned is St. Clement of Rome, who was the third pope ordained as a bishop by St. Peter. So this really, you know, the Mormons say, well, the Mormons do believe Peter was the head of the church. They believe that. Head of all Christian churches at the beginning. And then it went off the rails. So I asked them, okay, I would ask them if they got into a discussion. I'd say, well, now here's a man who was ordained Pope by St. Peter. Uh, he wasn't ordained Pope, he was ordained Bishop. Then he was elected Pope. There's Peter, then there's two others, and then there's St. Clement. His letter to the Corinthians is the only thing we really know was written by him. Mid uh, 90s. And the letter to the Romans clearly teaches faith is the way you get saved, grace is the way you get saved. Then you have good works. And good works are really important to show that you have faith, not as a way to get faith. That's, they just, what, what Mormon scholars will do is they'll pick out a little line here and a little line here and a little line here, a lot from Gnostic sources and kind of semi-Christian sources of the first couple of centuries and say, see, they were secretly teaching Mormonism because this line can be correlated with this line. Let's see, then I had a hand here, then I had one over here. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he gives a thesis on like the dimension of free will. Like, can they like with, with the nature of God? Do you think it's a placeholder rather than say like the nature itself? Because they hold that that God can be wrong and error. So in that case, like Jesus was wrong or could be wrong in saying that Peter like the gates of hell cannot prevail. They don't want to say that, but they're committed to that in this way. I have presented to my class two, a list of two ideas about God, column A and column B. Column A is the traditional idea, most of the attributes I took from Aquinas, you know, because he's the one who really gives you a nice rational answer for why these are the attributes of God. Eternal, immutable, impassable, immaterial. Uh, omniscient, omnipotent, uh, a, a list. And then there's column B. And this God is mutable, material, uh, doesn't know, is not omniscient, doesn't know exactly the future. And a number of other, at, uh, the attributes that exactly the other side disagrees with. And I say, look, if you want to believe in God B with all these attributes, that's your privilege. But that isn't Christianity and I'm not appealing to faith there. I can show you rationally how that has all these deficiencies. And then over here, that's this one. But let's remember, it's not a cafeteria. If you want to believe in A, you have to take all these attributes together, the ones Christianity does. If you want to believe in B, you've got to take all those attributes together. You can't take things you like from B and things you like from A because it doesn't work that way. And uh, that's just the way. Okay, I have a hand here. More hands. One, two, and then we'll just keep going. To people. Yes, I've got, okay, you. Mormons are really just out 
Okay, uh, that concept that Mormonism is the fastest growing is partially true and partially wrong. They do a lot of missionary evangelization. But in North America, of, con let's say, converts in 2013, by the end or the middle of 2014, after a year, 50% of adult Mormon converts will no longer be involved with the Mormon church. Their name may still be on the rolls, but they won't be involved with the Mormon church. What? Uh, because you can be, well, my own assessment, and the, the Catholic statistic is 80% of the people who were baptized in North America when I was baptized last vigil, a year later, will still be attending Mass somewhere. Now, because of our mobile society, that may not be in the parish that they were baptized in, but they will still be attending Mass. Part of it is, if you met a Mormon missionary tomorrow, you could be converted, quote unquote, and baptized in three weeks. You have no idea what you're doing. For me, it took a year and a half. I knew what I was doing, but I knew that before. But, you know, I learned about it in a careful, thoughtful way before baptism. So it takes longer. It's more thoughtful. It sticks. How can you reach out? I would reach out by... I would just point out there, there wasn't really an apostasy. I'm sorry about that for you, that you believe this. But there really wasn't. I would use scripture, the real presence. And just tell them, ask them if they believe in a God who created the universe. Do you believe the first chapter of Genesis? And they'll probably say yes. And then just point out, that isn't the God your church believes in. That's the God we believe in. There are many, on my campus, university statistics, say there are about 70% of our undergraduates who would consider themselves active congregants of the Mormon church. But there are hundreds. My campus probably has 23,000 students. There are many who are going to the Mormon church and don't believe it. They're going for social reasons. If that's where all your friends are going, that's a good place to go just to meet people, have something to do, maybe find a date. And they don't really believe it. They're doubting, they're questioning, they're challenged. Maybe what you can do is, there's this fabulous photograph that I just saw online it's Pope Benedict saying Mass in front of the Colosseum. Have you seen that? And it, it was moving to me because here is the symbol of the greatest empire in the world, the Roman Empire. And here's the symbol. And here is the Pope who represents the church that they tried for hundreds of years to destroy and who was destroyed and who's still around preaching the same, teaching the same eternal truths. It's a visual representation that, that tells you something. 
Roman authorities and the Jewish authorities thought that they had uh, gotten rid of the Christians with the cross. Romans thought, we'll persecute them. Yes, we'll stamp them out. <coughs> Pliny. That famous letter to Trajan, his emperor, saying, I wanted to find out what the Christians were doing. They wouldn't tell me, so I tortured them. They still wouldn't tell me, but I found out defectors and so forth. And they were having a mass pretty much like we have today, <laughs> 100. But Pliny said, I wanted to find out. They wouldn't tell me. I tortured them. Well, we're still here. And Pliny's empire is gone. Okay, another hand. I had another hand. Yes. And then I'll have one from... Well, I went through that. I really agonized because I know Mitt Romney personally. He was a graduate student in law and business when I was a student at Harvard. My problem with Romney is, is not the same as, is not exactly the same as my problem with uh, other Mormon candidates because Romney when he ran for Senate in 1994 against Ted Kennedy in Massachusetts, proudly proclaimed himself as pro-life, uh, as pro-choice, excuse me, pro-choice. He was pro-choice when he ran for governor of Massachusetts in 2002. He was pro-choice, proudly pro-choice. And he said when his mother ran for the Senate, and you can look it up, when his mother ran for the Senate, in Michigan in 1970, she was pro-choice. And he had called the Mormon leadership in Salt Lake when he ran for the Senate and when he ran for and won as governor of Massachusetts, saying, well, I get into trouble with the Mormon church for uh, saying I'm pro-choice. And they said no. And then when he wanted to run for president in a Republican ticket, he became pro-life. I don't know what his real belief is. Uh, Mormons say they're pro-life. They oppose abortion except, and here are the exceptions, Life or health of the mother, rape and incest, and life, life or health of the mother, rape or incest, and grave fetal defect. That's what the Mormon church believes. Now, I can understand politically why that's maybe all we can get to in this life. But on election night, this last election, I was reading, just to quell my unease about the state of the world, I was reading St. Augustine's City of God, part of it. <laughs> Don't try to make the city of man the city of God. Just recognize that there is another city. <laughs>